So you'll want to go to seminary. That is one of the most difficult yet fun and joyful things to be thinking about, especially during a pandemic. So in this video, I'm going to talk briefly uh, as a way of pausing my material on entire sanctification and talk about five things to be thinking about before you decide to pursue a seminary education. I say this as someone who has done, well, it wasn't quite four years, it was actually a lot longer than that, but I, I did graduate. So uh, at least four years of undergrad work uh, and got the paper thing saying I did it. And then uh, three years in seminary, and now I'm starting my uh, further doctoral work, which means I'll be in school for another probably three to six years, depending on how all this goes. And here are kind of five things that I think are essential for uh, someone looking to go into seminary or seminary education. And now uh, these are not the only five. There are probably hundreds of reasons why you would go to seminary or things to, that you'd want to think about before going to seminary. These are just five that I think are really important. And so let us look real quick at this. So, and of course it goes without saying, but uh, like and subscribe to this channel, uh, this little experiment that we might call a YouTube channel. Uh, it only, I'm at 80, 80, 79 subscribers, but over 500 views, which isn't too bad for a guy who's currently uh, doing this while his wife sleeps and his baby, yep, baby is still asleep. So uh, if you would like, if you are moved by this or you think this is awesome, or even if you think it sucks, but you want other people to see how much it sucks, so you can kind of build up a, a suck, you know, fan base, you know, the anti fan base. Uh, by all means, uh, subscribe and share. So uh, the first, uh, so here are the five things to know before going to seminary or five things at least to be thinking about. Uh, first one is um, that you need to do is pray. And we'll of course extrapolate that. But um, prayer is something I think a lot of people kind of don't do very well when it comes to further education, especially something in the theological realm, whether it be biblical studies, philosophy, apologetics, or what have you. Uh, the second one is you're going to want to narrow your field. And that doesn't mean you narrow your, your field to the point where you know every, you know, I, yes, I want to study not just New Testament and not just Mark studies, but I want to study uh, John the Baptist and Mark. And not only John the Baptist, but I want to know about this one little verse in the gospel of Mark, you're not going to go to seminary and do that. That's, you know, if you're going to do a master's, you know, uh, an MA or an MDiv or something like that, or a uh, master of arts in Christian studies or something, you're not probably going to be doing that. That is for either your thesis or for a really esoteric class with a really affirming and wonderful professor, but more than likely that's doctoral work. But it's really helpful if you're going into seminary to get a master's or an MDiv, to begin to kind of think about the kind of classes that you want to take, uh, think about kind of your future as it relates to Christian education, you know, um, and part of that too, and not this is more of a broader point is, um, what do you plan on doing with your master's or your, we'll just say master's, which can include the MDiv. The MDiv is generally considered a degree for pastors, although it's not exclusively that. Um, but thinking about what you want to do, what your, what your goal is to accomplish. Are you going just purely for the, the sport of learning and, uh, or, or learning? And that's very valuable. Are you, do you want to be a pastor? Do you want to be a, uh, a professor? Do you want to be a pastor theologian? Those are, they exist. Do you, you know, what, what are you looking for? And it doesn't mean you have to have all of it kind of figured out uh, instantly, but having kind of a ballpark kind of, uh, kind of plan is, is really helpful. Don't just go into seminary and take classes and kind of hope and pray that you come out, you know, with what you were exactly looking for, because chances are, given how the Holy Spirit works, you're, it's probably going to be a bit of a challenge. 
That's number two. Number three is decide on which seminary. And that may seem dumb to some or wickedly brilliant to others, but it's we'll, we'll talk about why that's an essential part. Um, and that includes knowing why that seminary exists and um, theologically where they are and all that sort of stuff. The next one is getting connected. You want to get connected to faculty. Um, and we'll talk more about that. And number five is read books. Read books before going to seminary. Don't go to seminary to read books. Read books now. So let's get into these. Number one, uh, pray, reflect, pray and reflect. You know, and, and and what I did was when I applied to Fuller, I once I got I got permission from my wife, of course, uh, at least to some extent. There's a big bit, bit of a story behind that. Not my proudest moment, but you know, it all seemed to work out despite my fumbling around. Uh, but the first thing you should do is pray. And I mean that seriously. Pray and ask God to reveal and to guide and to shed light. Because um, you don't want to go in this on your own. And it's not to say God is not with you wherever you go, but invite the Lord to be a part of this process, to listen. And the second is uh, reflect. And this is a big big, a big deal, is why am I going to seminary? Why, why the hell am I going to spend anywhere from 25 to 40 to $60,000, depending on the seminary and financial aid and all that, to like, why am I going to spend all that money on a degree? You know, what, why? What, what is the purpose? What is the telos to that? Where, where am I going? And of course, plans change, circumstances change. That's understandable. But um, ask yourself that question, why am I going to seminary? Am I going just so I have a degree? Um, am I going because I just want to learn and be educated and know more about my faith and about the Bible? Um, you know, why? Ask that why question and, and be serious about that why. Um, be honest with yourself. Are you, do you want to be that person in the conversation that goes, well, as someone with a, a master of, of divinity from I don't know, um, bum tussle goofy seminary, you know, and I don't know what's a place, what's a state I want to pick on Georgia, because that sounds like a Georgia thing. Go to go dogs, uh, bum tussle nowhere seminary in Georgia. Uh, then your, your experience will be very different. What are you looking for? Why are you going to seminary? Are you going to be the smartest guy in the room? Are you going to be you know, like, what are you looking for? And if that's the case, if you're looking to be the smartest person in the room, um, don't go to seminary. Because at the end of the day, you can pick a fight with a Calvinist and you'll learn probably a lot more and it'll be a little cheaper. Although you probably won't get that time back. And depending on how you view time, um, that may be something you want to consider. But in any sense, pray and reflect. Check yourself, check your heart, make sure you're doing this for the right reasons. Because it is one, expensive, no matter where you go, it's expensive. Two, it's a massive investment. And three, if you're married, uh, and I was married when I started seminary, if you are married, then that is not just you going to seminary, that is your spouse going to seminary. And if your wife or your husband doesn't, uh, isn't fully on board with your calling and you're all that sort of stuff, then it'll be really difficult because in, in the case of you being in the library four or five hours during the week or 10 hours during the week, uh, that can create resentment. And that can create um, kind of a hostile spirit between you and your spouse. And that is something you want to avoid because you're going to seminary to learn about the Bible and about Jesus. You shouldn't have that. And so it means if you are married, taking the time to respect your spouse and include them in your prayer life. That's 1 Corinthians 7 in a nutshell. Respect your spouse enough to hear what he or she says and make sure you're doing it for the right reasons. The third, um, third point is talk to your pastor. Um, or if you don't have a pastor in the sense of, you know, we're in a pandemic right now, I get it. You're maybe not meeting a lot. Maybe you've got four or five pastors. You know, you watch Greg Boyd, you watch Tara Beth Leach, uh, you watch Beth Moore or listen to Beth Moore or, or, or whatever. Um, if you're, uh, and so you may not have instant access to them and that's fine, but Find people that you trust theologically, spiritually. They can be kind of a spiritual dad or a mom to you. They can be a spiritual brother or sister. Someone or some people who have um, both integrity and honesty and will ask the right questions 
they're not uh, yes people like oh you you should go to a seminary or well, seminaries for for you know the uh, seminary is cemetery it's where your faith goes to die you don't want to you want people that will challenge you but affirm you if that is what is needed and they'll be able to see are you praying and are you reflecting and are you doing this for the right reasons and if you're lying or you're self-deceived or you're uh you got a narrow way of viewing it or you got a bit of pride then they'll call you out and good that's part of the process that's part of the process of learning that's part of sanctification you can watch my other videos what i think about sanctification but so talk to your pastor talk to your elders talk to your deacons talk to your friends make sure and don't just talk to people that will give you what you want to hear ask the hard questions why am i going to seminary and do these people trust me with that and that kind of dovetails into the next one what are your gifts and calling um and that doesn't mean that you have to know 100 how that works but what do other people see in you does your pastor believe that you have gifts and calling you know teaching uh, preaching you know um there there are some uh, younger people at our church uh, specifically um uh there's a younger woman at our church uh who's very involved and i can sense a teaching or preaching ministry for her and that's something i tell her parents you know keep, keep an eye on her like she there may be a gift there there may be a calling there and making sure that you are aware of that you know self-aware you know it's not just it, it's not just enough to have a drive or, or 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 an itch it's i'm actually gifted in this thing and i see it and people affirm it and people want it to grow you know uh, i i didn't take a single uh preaching class in seminary and yet i'm an associate pastor and that's because people at the church where i serve or I'm blessed to serve, uh, saw in me gifts that I didn't think I had, or at least that were underdeveloped. And that's part of the beauty and the wonder of the local church, is people see in you gifts and calling, and they can kind of guide you in that process and affirm you and challenge you. All three of that is all three of those kind of principles are needed. And so talk to your pastor and think about your gifts and calling, not just what do I want, but what is the spirit giving to me? What is the spirit gifted me with? And maybe it means you don't have to go to seminary to have those gifts. You don't need to necessarily be, you know, get an MDiv in preaching if you can preach. Now, hear what I'm saying. It's not necessary, but it is important. And I would argue vital, not necessary, meaning it doesn't have to work 100%. It's not 100 out of 100 but i would venture to say it's in the high 90s you know so it's it's important and then again going back to the whole point of this what is the purpose of going what is the purpose of going and that's something that needs to be teased out through the church through your family of faith through your spouse if you're married and by all accounts being honest with yourself with what you want and what you feel you need so that's point number one Point number two, as I mentioned, yes, this is coffee and I am recording at 11, 11.33 at night. Uh, narrow your field. Now, some folks kind of go into a seminary program, say the MDiv, and they just kind of go, I, I just want I just want to learn. And so the MDiv will give you kind of, you know, 30% preaching classes, you know, 30% language classes. 30% uh, um, the you know, theological classes, you know, um, historical theology, systematic theology, and then maybe another 10% of electives, you know, where you can kind of maybe begin to specialize a little bit. Um, but the purpose of seminary is not to be so narrow as to basically get tunnel vision theologically. But think about while you're in seminary, what you're doing, what, what do you actually want to study? For me, when I started at Fuller, I wanted to be a New Testament guy. I didn't want to. I didn't want to do Old Testament studies. I didn't want to do systematic theology. I didn't want to do preaching. Every single elective that was available to me, um, and I tested out of New Testament intro, which is kind of the introductory class, and I tested out of. I think I tested. Yeah, I tested out of that, um, which gave me another elective. And every single elective I had was a Pauline exegesis class whether it's Galatians Greek text or Ephesians Greek text or Philippians Greek text or, or whatever. Um, and that allowed me to narrow my field. But again, that wasn't narrowing on a specific topic. You know, that's doctoral work or maybe a THM, you know, second master's. Um, but 
begin to kind of think about what you want to do, where your gifts and calling might be. If you have a love for the prophets, then taking classes in the prophets would be a really good way of kind of affirming that gift or disconfirming it. You know, you may just get in the seminary and be like, you know, I hate Hebrew uh, and I really love Greek. And then you're in a place where you can begin to kind of kind of narrow your focus a little bit. You're not going to be able to take the, all the specialized classes that you want or do all the specialized research that you want. But you begin, you can begin to kind of get a vision of where you're going. And that's part of the blessing of getting an MDiv or an MA is it kind of it forces you from out here, you know, the forest, and it begins to get you looking at the trees. And the doctoral program or a THM or whatever is you looking at a tree like very closely that, but you can see going from 30,000 feet down to that level. And so what do you want to study? What do you want to learn? And I would actually assert very strongly that it doesn't matter what you're doing, doesn't matter what you want to study. You could want to study preaching, you could want or homiletics, you could want to study um, systematic theology or philosophy of religion. Learn Greek and Hebrew. Learn Greek and Hebrew. It will change your life. It'll make your life very difficult for the you know one, two, three, four quarters, or however many there are. But learn Greek and Hebrew. That is the language of the Bible that God has gifted to us. And if you want to understand it, and if you want to be able to preach it, then you need to know what God said. That's, that's just the bottom line. Take Greek, take Hebrew, don't take the easy way out, slog through it, you'll be glad that you did. And if you have questions about how to learn Greek, or at least kind of stuff like that, um, ask, ask in the comments, and I'll, I'm happy to tell you. Um, Greek is, uh, Hebrew I'm not particularly great at. I got A's in Hebrew, but I got A minuses in Greek. And for those who know me, I didn't, I've not, I've not done anything in Hebrew since then. I'm a Greek guy through and through. So what do you want to study? Begin to think about what, what gets you up in the morning, what um, empowers you, what captivates you. You may be captivated by pneumatology. You know, it's just the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. That's just, that's just your jam. You can't take every single class in that, but you be, you can begin to take maybe some electives or do a directed reading or directed study with a professor, you know? Um, I did that at Fuller. Uh, I basically wrote my class, you know, my syllabus. I wrote out a mini syllabus and pitched it to a New Testament guy named Dr. Tommy Givens, who's still at Fuller, amazing professor. Uh, he went to Duke and he said, yes. And we studied Pauline eschatology for 10 weeks. You know, we read a ton of books and we had conversations and it was great. It was a wonderful experience. So there is that option too. So maybe that's a way of narrowing your field and figuring out what do you want to study? And it may just be that you love the Holy, you love, you love pneumatology for nine weeks. And then the final week you go, you know what? It's a brick wall. I, I, I just, it doesn't, it doesn't hold up for me. It doesn't mean you have to be a specialist or love the same thing, you know, the whole time. I, I really enjoyed um, my systematic theology classes, but I couldn't imagine being a systematic theologian. So, you know, people learn, people grow, people change. Allow yourself to be molded and to transform. That's just how that goes. Uh, what do you want to learn? And that's a big thing too. And so I'll use apologetics as an example. I was, I'm very blessed to have a bunch of really cool apologetic friends, John Dunphy, Zach Seckler, uh, Cameron Bertuzzi, uh, Hayden Clark, all those, all those guys. Um, there's more, of course. Um, uh, Carl Olhoff, uh, just great people, great guys. Um, I always tell my apologetic friends, apologist friends, there we go. Um, and there's kind of, well, okay, we'll jump down to this. What do you want to learn? If you're an apologist, you maybe you see that there's a particular, there's the problem of evil, or there's the problem of animal suffering, or there's a problem of New Testament reliability. Although I think New Testament reliability is kind of tapped out. Everyone's like, ooh, I can speak to that. And it's just like, okay, it's, I, I think, I think most Christians aren't worried about that. It's the problem of ethics, or it's a problem of theology within the New Testament. It's not the New Testament itself in terms of historical reliability. Most people are kind of willing to grant that, um, but that's just, that's a, a side point. So I'll skip down to expertise in the future. You know, do you want to be a generalist or do you want to be a specialist? And that's kind of on a spectrum, you know, it's like, you know, five here, you know, for a generalist, five here for specialist, and you can maybe find yourself, you know, over towards this way, or over towards this way, or in the middle or something like that. But you generally want to find yourself kind of leaning towards one. For me, uh, I'm not a generalist. My doctoral research will not be a generalist. I will not be in the generalist camp. 
Um, so that's something to think about. The world needs generalists and the world needs specialists. But I would tell all my apologetics apologist friends, become an expert in something that is relevant to your field. So you are an expert in your field and then you can do apologetics from that field. Um, if you want to, uh, I think Mike Jones is doing this where he's getting a degree, a master, I don't know if master's, but he's getting a degree in something in the heart, in the sciences. And he'll be able to speak with that degree and that expertise into that specific field and from that specific field. Um, and I think that's really important. So uh, Craig Evans is, uh, is considered an apologist. I don't know if I call him an apologist, but as an expert in historical Jesus studies, um, he can do quite a bit from that field and has impact in apologetics. And so being, I would generally tell people, be a, a specialist, find two or three things that are, that are your jam. Like um, you are the, well, I'll use myself as an example. I'm the women in ministry guy and almost every, any theology group I'm in, um, I'm, the, I'm the guy that gets tagged if someone says something dumb or uneducated or silly or makes a joke or is asking for resources or, or wants a fight. I'm the guy that gets tagged. Um, that's just kind of how it goes. I'm known as that guy which is weird because my wife knows a lot more about it than I do. So um, y'all need to tag my wife or tag me so I can tag my wife. That's probably a better way of saying it. But think about, do you want to go the generalist or specialist route? And again, there's a spectrum to it, but you'll generally find yourself, generally, you find yourself on leaning towards one of the two. And the other one is, if you just want to be a pastor, you know, if you want to go into pastoral ministry, there are MDivs and master's degrees just for that and um, still learn Greek and Hebrew, you know, they'll make you a better preacher of God's word, but be thinking about where you want to go, or even thinking about the job you might want to do to get to the dream job that you want, you know, if you want to be a, if your goal is to, I don't know, um, be a, uh, a chaplain, you want to be that, or maybe you want to be the spiritual director at a university, maybe that means you uh, get a degree in pastoral ministry, and you're a pastor for a few years, you know, maybe a youth pastor or assistant or associate pastor for a few years, then you move on to a university chaplain, and then you kind of work your way up. But have a sort of grand vision for where you kind of want to go and kind of move in that direction. And if you're still praying and still reflecting, the spirit will nudge you that way or nudge you that way or let you keep going straight and you'll be able to figure it out. So there's, there's no hard science to this, but it, there is a sense of if you do the right things and you're attentive, good things will happen. So number three, something to ask yourself before going to seminary, and this is number three, is what seminary to attend and why? What seminary to attend and why? So if you are, uh, let's say you get out of undergrad, right? So you do your bachelor's of arts or bachelor of science or a bachelor of theology, you do one of those, and you come out and you're like, I am a reformed baptist god knows why but i'm a reformed baptist and that is where my conviction lies i'm kidding my calvinist friends like we're just we're, we're making jokes um but i'm a reformed baptist and it's like okay you probably won't want to go to asbury theological seminary or wesley biblical seminary you're probably not going to want to go there or if you come out like i did you come out as a wesleyan baptist and you're like yeah i'm kind of there I'm not going to go to RTS. I'm not going to go to the Master Seminary. I'm not going to go to Calvin Theological Seminary. Um, I'm, I'd consider Princeton, you know, but Princeton, you know, but kind of begin to think about like, am I going to be miserable in this place? Do I want to be in the minority in this place? And there's something to be said about going to a place that will challenge you, um, but is broadly in line with your convictions. So for me, I went to Fuller and I chose Fuller mostly because I, the only options if I'm going to campus were uh, Talbot and I can't, I couldn't sign Talbot's doctrinal statement. Their section on eschatology was really, is really, really, really narrow and I can't sign it. Um, and they probably wouldn't accept me if I could, if, you know, I even, you know, they probably wouldn't let me in. Master Seminary, which I don't, I, I think um, they probably would, I mean, in their mind, I probably turned to rock salt if I stepped on campus or looked at the campus wrong. Uh, the other one is Claremont School of Theology, which is is way to my left and not a place where I, I would want, um, I just want to go. And that left uh, Fuller. And of course, I was already a fan of Fuller. Um, I, I agreed with them on their distinctives of a broad evangelicalism, of, a, of a egalitarianism when it came to women in ministry, 
and you know, and the faculty's killer. And it's just great faculty. So those three things, I was like, yeah, boom, I'm going to Fuller, you know. And I and yeah, and and I have no regrets going to Fuller. As a great school, uh, but you can see kind of tailing your interest to that. Um, if you're kind, if you're, I don't know, um, if you're, you know, sorry, use Reformed Baptist. Maybe you're, um, you know, maybe you're just non-denominational, a little bit of charismatic, a little bit of Baptist. Um, go to, and you're undecided on kind of a lot of secondary things. You know, you don't know. You kind of affirm the gifts, but you don't know why. You think um, women might be able to be preachers, but not elders, and you're not sure why. Um, you know, you know, does baptism save? Well, your church says so, but you're not so sure. Then finding a place that doesn't place itself as the only orthodox alternative is a good place to go. Um, so Fuller would be a really good, really good place for you, or Northern Seminary, or Truett, you know, um, a place that'll allow you to kind of figure out where you fall on the secondary issues. Um, not that those schools uh, don't have opinions, but those schools would allow you and encourage you and affirm you in your opinions. Um, they won't go unchallenged, of course, but that's the whole point. Um, and so the seminaries, I, I kind of tend to recommend kind of the top five that keep coming back to me is Fuller, obviously, a Northern Seminary where Scott McKnight, uh, Najee Gupta, um, uh, Ingrid Farrow's, uh, I believe they're still there who's an Old Testament expert. Uh, I want to, I, I think Dennis Edwards was there. I don't know if he still is. I think he's at North Park, which is near Northern. Um, great school, American, uh, evangelical, uh, American Baptist, or affiliated with my denomination, great school. Uh, Trua, which is in Waco, Texas. So basically between Austin and DFW. Uh, great Baptist school, uh, very friendly to Wesley, Wesleyan theology. Uh, William Abraham is now, I think, working at working there. Um, but you know, David Garland, Todd Still, Roger Olson, great place. Asbury, you know, you got Craig Keener. Do not need I say any more? And it's a great school uh, on the more expensive side, but they have scholarships. And the place where I'm going for my doctor is Ridley Theological College in Melbourne, Aust uh, Melbourne, Australia. And I'm going there for many reasons. But uh, look at the bottom three. They have killer faculty. They have killer publications. And they have a good reputation. And also, um, Mike Bird's awesome. That's kind of just how it goes. Um, so those are the seminaries I tend to recommend to people. And all of them, with the exception of, I think, Truett, uh, are fully online. So there is that component as well. So thinking in terms of geography and distance and time zone. Ridley is 19 hours ahead of me or ahead of, ahead of where I'm living right now. So that makes, makes it all interesting. But, but think about where you want to go where your theological convictions are and you, how challenged do you wanna be? If you believe that the earth was created 6,000 years ago or 4,000 years ago, and that is your bedrock conviction, don't go to Fulmer. The master's seminary is a perfect place. And even Talbot probably be a little, you know, wouldn't be in your comfort zone. So think about where you're coming from on that. And so I think that's important. And the kind of seminaries you look at the faculty, are they world renowned? Are they experts in their fields? Are they respected in their fields? Uh, are they publishing in, in prestigious places? Are they also writing books for the local church? Are they writing books that you and I and scholars can read kind of, you know, across the board? Um, are, they, are they involved in the local church? Do they preach? Do they pray? Do they worship? Or do they make time for students? Fuller was a great place for that as an example. Um, and how's the reputation? You know, those are a bunch of things to think about before attending seminary or what seminary to attend. So fourth, and I think this is important. It's a little more difficult. Uh, for me, I'm an introvert, a very introverted person, um, but getting connected to faculty at that seminary. Um, a lot of faculty are very willing to meet. They have office hours and in a pandemic, you can probably schedule something a little easier. Uh, get connected with them, become friends with them, learn from them, talk to them, uh, read their books. Um, get the syllabus they, they have for classes if you can't attend. So you can look at the syllabus and see what books they have. And then you go buy those books, which is point number five. Um, and get connected to a local church. You know, if you are living in Texas or Kansas or Virginia and your school's in Illinois or Texas, you know, Texas is big, or California or Arizona or Melbourne, Australia, um, 
you need to figure out how that's all going to work. And uh, being in a place where you can connect with faculty is, is really important because one, you'll want recommendations. If you, if they like you, they'll want to write recommendations for you, but two, um, learning from them is vital and you may learn something from sitting in a class and listening to them lecture. Well, you'll learn a lot more when you just talk to them. They're, 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 paid, they're literally paid to be there to be mentors for you and to challenge you and to help you grow spiritually. And that's, of course, an idealistic thing that I'm saying, um, but I think that's also true. And being involved in the local church, I would argue, is vital to this as well. Because at the end of the day, if you're a Christian and you believe Jesus is Lord and scripture has authority and all that sort of stuff, if you go and you can't take what you're learning and give it to people in your local church, then what you're doing is not good. The purpose of scholarship, in my humble opinion, if you're a Christian, is ultimately to grow the church and to disciple the church. Theology should lead to discipleship and transformation. So that's something to think about too. Does your seminary have a dim view of people that sit in your pulpit? Do they have a dim view of a 90-year-old woman who's been a deacon at your church for you know 40 years and is faithful and all that sort of, but doesn't have a high school education, do they view her rightly? Do they respect her? Do they talk well about her in class? And if not, that is not a good seminary because at the end of the day, that woman is the reason that church is probably there, that it's still working. And a seminary should instill in you a love for the local church. Oh, and no one's awake. I will be right back. Uh, I will pause this. How do I pause this? Let's see. Ah, I will pause. No, that did not work. Let's see. And pause recording. Okay. Let's see how long he lasts. So moving back to where we were before we were so awfully interrupted. Good Lord. All right. So yeah, check why you are doing something. There we go. That's point number four. And then point number five, read books, read lots of books. So part of seminary is you're not going to be able to read every single book that you get or that you want to. Uh, that's what Amazon wish lists are for. So make sure you are constantly saving books because it is very easy in the hubbub of seminary. If you're doing a class or two or even three a semester or quarter, you will forget things. So uh, if you're in my kind of area, New Testament studies, read authors like Scott McKnight, John Barclay, Najee Gupta, uh, Aaron Haim, Lynn Kohik, Issa McCauley, Michael Bird. Uh, read authors like that. Um, if you're in New Testament, maybe I'll do a whole uh, another video on what kinds of books you should read if you want to uh, do New Testament studies. Um, Maybe we'll do something like that. Uh, I still have to do the final video for Christian Perfection, my entire sanctification series. Um, but we'll see. So, but I felt like doing something a little different because life is weird and I can do what I want because I'm an adult. But depending on what field that you're going to be in, read those books. And if you connect with the faculty, they will know what books you, order, you should read because they probably either wrote them or they know the people that wrote them. So at the end of the day, you've got this. Five things to know before going to seminary. One, pray and reflect upon what is going on in your head and your heart. Make sure your pastor and your friends and your spouse, if you are married, are in on this and can support you and challenge you. Two, uh, begin thinking about narrowing your field and where you want to kind of go and why you're going to seminary in the first place. Number three, decide on which seminary because of faculty, publications, and resources. And there's, of course, other factors that, you know, fact, that factors that factor into that. But think about those. Uh, number four, get connected to faculty. And number five, read books. Um, I think a big issue with all of this is making sure that whatever you do, you are doing it for the right reasons. It is not super easy to get a job after seminary or even uh, in seminary in your field, but it is not impossible. So those are five things you can kind of do 
uh, before you go to seminary and things to be thinking about before going to seminary. And uh, I hope they are helpful. Uh, if you have additional insights or comments or ideas, comment below and I will respond to them. Or if you have questions, put them in the comment box and I will happily try to answer them. Uh, he's moving around, but oh, he stopped moving. So we'll see how, uh, maybe I get a few extra minutes. But uh, comment below, tell me um, one, if you're thinking about going to seminary and where, and uh, any questions you have, you know, what, you know, if you wanna do Old Testament studies and you wanna be an apologist, there's plenty to do there. Um, I may not be able to point you in the right direction of books, but I can certainly tell you what, there's a few authors you should probably read. Um, but that's part of the whole idea of this channel, being a resource for, for you, being a place where uh, the mind and the heart are taken seriously in terms of spiritual formation and academic work. And make sure at the end of the day that you're doing, that you're going to seminary for the right reasons, because the local church needs people that have gone to seminary, people that have taken the time to study, to wrestle with, and to think about how God has acted in the world. And being involved in that conversation in the wider academy is great, but if you can't preach it, if you can't give it to your, your pastor friend and she can't get behind the pulpit and preach it, then maybe think about that. You know, we are in the business as Christians of making disciples and helping people learn what it means to follow Jesus with heart and mind. And that's part of the joy and the perils of seminary. So those are five things. If there's anything else you would think about adding, comment below. If there's anything from that you don't like, comment below or just don't, you know, negativity is negativity. But if you feel the urge, then go ahead. Um, for those who are thinking of going to seminary, send this to them. Uh, if you have someone that wants to be a pastor, send this to them. And hopefully it'll be a blessing to them and it'll uh, allow them to get in contact with me and we can talk. Follow me on Twitter at, at Nick Quint, Q-U-I-E-N-T. My name, N-I-C-K-Q-U-I-E-N-T. Um, and yeah, just reach out if you have questions or insights. Um, I'm pretty, I check my YouTube channel a couple times a day, but I hope that you have a, I'll be releasing this Saturday morning or Saturday-ish morning, um, which is in eight hours, eight to 10 hours. But I hope you have a wonderful day. And because this is dropping before you're going to, uh, before Sunday, make sure you read your Bible, you pray, and you go to church. Make sure you go to church. Don't neglect the good things of God. Go to church. All right. Blessings. This is Nick, your uh, friendly neighborhood New Testament theologist. And I am finishing my coffee and signing out.